start the recording. Um, so, um, like I said, I hope, hope people are doing well. Um, I kind of want to begin by begin just some sort of general overview of what's going on, some description of what's happening. Um, just bear in mind that you know, toward the end of the week, reading assignments, uh, the, re the reading assignment 16, parts one and two are due this Friday at five. Looks like some people have already turned those in. So when, as people turn them in, I'll do my best to kind of respond to them in, in as timely a way as I can. Um, remember that for those reading assignments, the main point is that you just kind of want a summary of what's going on in chapter 16. So one possible approach to those two reading assignments is first start by reading chapter 16, just kind of go through the first two or three sections. And I believe that's the content of the part one reading assignment. Um, and, then, and then go back and read the summary and then make a set of notes to yourself trying to identify. There, there, so someone, asked, Lily asks, is there a rubric? There, there really isn't um, because there's no, there's no particular thing you're supposed to turn in. Um, my overall sense of, of the reading assignments is that these are just summaries of what you're gonna see in chapter 16. So you know, my advice on the reading assignments is just to treat them as summaries. There's nothing you in particular have to do with them. Um, you know, my advice is to read them Think about them a little bit. Um, when you submit something in support of the two reading assignments, um, what I've been telling people, and I mentioned this, I think, on Monday, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll state it again. Um, come up with a set of questions that you have, maybe four or five questions that you feel like are the most important, that you feel like you don't understand, that you want answered. Um, so, you know, it can be lots of different possible, possible things that you could ask. Um, and you don't even have to have four or five. I mean, if you read if you read what's going on in chapter 16, if you read the summaries and it's totally transparent to you, um, then maybe you'll only have like a couple of questions or something like that. But if you have more, that's fine. And I'll try to answer those, I think, via comments on Blackboard after you get a chance to submit those by Friday. Um, I'm almost done grading written assignment five. I think it's gone pretty well. You can see the solutions to five on Blackboard. Um, there are a couple of issues that I would point out that I think that people had um, along the way. Um, one issue I think was uh, in problem two, um, the table um, that represented the distribution of the random variable. Um, there, were, there were a couple of different types of errors there. One was extremely minor and I didn't worry about it that much. Um, it's that if you, if you notice that the lowest possible payout in that problem is $1 um, rather than zero, which is I think what some people thought, but that's not really such a big deal. Um, the larger issue is, um, is the probability, the probability calculation themselves. I think a lot of people wanted to treat X as a binomial random variable, but it really isn't. Um, it has much more in common with the geometric random variable. Um, there's a connection between the sequences that generate certain payouts, um, and the probability of those sequences. So you just have to go back and think a little bit about how you know certain sequences, what the probability of those sequences really, really are in this example, and just write those things down. Um, so you can see the solutions, but you might want to. If I made a comment that you know looks like a binomial model in your work, but it really isn't, um, maybe go back and try it first. Then you can look at the solutions to kind of see where you're at. Um, one more comment, I guess. Um, this isn't happening on that widespread of a basis, but I do feel like I have to say something about it. Um, occasionally, people will submit a blank document for a written assignment. Um, you know, it's as though they have stored on their computer the written assignment, and maybe they've made adjustments to it, but they've, the file names, they get confused or something like that when they turn in the written assignment. Um, and so they wind up submitting a blank document. Um, go back and look at your grades, and in particular, look at the comments. If this happens, I'm going to make a note of it in the Blackboard comments, encouraging you to go back and send me a, what you actually intended to submit, which is probably on another, it has another file name on your computer. So just go back and check those things. If you notice that you get like a zero or something like that for a written assignment, but you did feel like you turned something in, that's probably what happened. Um, so go back and review that, um, check the grades. If you think that's occurred, um, send me an email with what you intended to submit rather than what was submitted, because in most of those cases, it's just a blank, doc a blank document. Um, Homework um, eight, I believe, is due on Monday at five o'clock. So that we're kind of back to the normal pattern. Um, written assignment six, which is I'm hoping a bit shorter than the normal written assignment. Hopefully it won't take that long to do, is due on Tuesday. I don't really have a rubric for it. Um, you know, it, it is kind of what you think. So if you want to try it without the rubric, that's fine. 
Um, I'll probably put one up closer to the weekend. So if people that have already submitted it want to wait until, or if you kind of want to wait until see, to see what the rubric looks like, that's also okay. Um, I guess that's all I have to say about this week. Remember, keep in the back of your mind that exam two is next week. Um, the material on exam two, um, it's between 10, uh, chapters 10 and 15 and two sections in chapter 16, section 16.1 and 16.2. The other sections um, will sort of delay, we'll, we'll defer those to some subsequent exam, I guess the final exam, when we'll sort of have a more comprehensive test, more comp comprehensive view of the semester. Um, so after all those announcements, I guess, um, does, does anyone have any, have any questions that are of a procedural nature? Okay. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to get back to kind of where we were on Monday. Um, I, I'd like to review, um, I'll write a few things down, which, which might be uh, useful in today's work. So let me share the screen. Um, I guess before I do that, let me make sure that I have enough blank pages to write on. Okay, so that looks good. Um, so let me share the screen and I'll sort of describe a little bit about where the discussion has landed. Um, where the discussion on Monday is landed. Um, so we're, we're at the point of the course where we're discussing um, so-called inferential statistics. Now, um, of course, this is sort of a, in, in 202, in the classical environment, um, this basically means we're interested We're interested in estimating the value of population parameters. Now, that's it's mostly what we'll see going forward. Um, there's some version of non-parametric statistics, which is which is related to some stuff that we talked about much earlier in the class. Um, we're probably not going to have time cover anything like that. But if we do, it's maybe in the last week when people get tired of review. Um, for example, we want to say something about the proportion P, the true proportion P sometimes it's called of dentists that prefer or that recommend um, the toothpaste crest to their clients. Um, and so the, the sort of underlying assumption in, in, in the classical environment is that there's actually, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of population proportion that's a number which we can discuss, though we don't know what it is. Um, there are other environments where um, where this is not the assumption, where, you, where you're sort of thinking that something like P follows a particular probability distribution. That's not this environment. Um, just again, and this, this turns out to be pretty pretty important for where we're going to sort of finish this, when we finish this week's discussion, we really think that P is a number. We may not know what it is, but we do think it's a number. We believe it's a number. Um, and so to estimate P, this true proportion, we gather a random sample, Let's sort of set these off and calculate within the sample, the proportion P hat, the sample proportion of dentist that recommend Crest. To their clients. Um, now, if, if you if you start this for a minute, what I'm recommending is you take one sample, you look at P hat, and um, we, we think of P hat as estimating the value of, of P. Um, P hat is called a point estimate. So one, so I'll say it this way, one realization of P hat, um, sometimes called a point estimate for P, it's just one number. Um, 
but if you if you follow the conversation up to this point, up to Monday, and you realize, we realize that p hat varies, even this example, with the random sample itself. So we treat, so I mean, another, another sort of maybe more way to make that concrete is that if I take a sample of 100 dentists and I get 61 of those different dentists recommending Crest, I get a point estimate of 0.61. It's one of the estimates you can get. Um, so P, that P hat that I got the 0.61 falls within say some universe of possibilities for P hat. But if you go out and take a sample of 100 dentists and ask them the same question, which, which you recommend, and you find that say 70% of them recommend Crest, then you have another point estimate. Um, so all of these values for P hat, all these different realizations for P hat, all these different point estimates that we're generating, um, because they're different, that, that shouldn't leave you troubled. Um, it's sort of a feature of, of how we're, we're, we're thinking about estimating P. We can gather together I guess what I'll call the universe of possibilities for P hat and put them in a histogram. Um, and we think of the histogram, um, I guess I should put that in quotes because there's an awful, awful lot of possible, possible values for P hat under our assumptions. Um, this histogram of sorts is sampling distribution of P hat. Um, and under some mild conditions, which, which we haven't really spelled out, um, but that's probably okay. Maybe I'll do that at the end of class today. Under mild conditions, um, P hat is approximately normal with mean P and with standard deviation P one minus P square root, square root of that divided by N. And just to elaborate, P is, uh, you know, the true population proportion population proportion, the true proportion, and is the sample size. And so what we're saying is that the histogram looks a bit like this, um, where you know, you can sort of, if you imagine yourself marking off units of standard deviation here, where in some sense, 68% um, of the P hats are here, 95% here and so forth. Um, so this is the way that the normal distribution might look in this situation. It's peaked over P hat. Um, and I guess one way of writing this is we can say that the standard, I guess I should use the standard notation, sigma of P hat, the standard deviation of P hat is on the nose equal to P times one minus P divided by the sample size. Um, so that's that's kind of where we are right now. So let's say maybe I complete sort of will abuse notation a little bit here. It's P plus sigma, P plus two sigma, P minus sigma, P minus two sigma. I'm just sort of, that's not Q. That's not quite what I want to write. Um, so you get this sort of image. Um, so before I move on, that's sort of the that's sort of the state of the conversation. Um, you know, under the mild conditions that are going to at least obtain at first in the examples we're going to consider, we can basically treat p hat as something that's normally distributed, and the mean of p hat is p, and the standard deviation is the square root thing. So, does anyone have any questions about this so far? I haven't talked about the conditions. Um, one way that you can kind of see that this is reasonable, though, yes, Lily. Oh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. When you were doing the standard deviation of p hat, um, mm -hmm. is it p times one minus p over n, or is it p hat times one minus p hat over n? Um, that's a good question. It's on the nose. It's p times one minus p. That's okay, what it yeah. actually is. But th this, but what you're bringing up is is a pretty important question because um, the the main effort when we try to think about p is we often don't know what it is, right? So the goal of trying to understand p hat or to compute it at all is to try to get some insight into what P is. Um, 
So when we do that, when we cook up what's called a confidence interval, we don't really have in mind any idea. We don't have in mind a particular value for P. I mean, that's the nature of the problem, right? We're trying to say something about what P is. And so in that standard deviation in the, in the, um, in the, in the, I think sometimes this is known as the standard error of p hat. It is actually equal to the square root of p times one minus p over n. But when we calculate a confidence interval, we replace p with p hat because, in some sense, that's all we really can do. Um, we haven't really talked about confidence intervals yet, but if you've read um, or if you're keeping up with the reading in chapter 16, the author gets to these pretty quickly. And so you don't really know what p hat is. And so when you figure out what the error is, the margin of error is in this type of calculation, um, you're, you're basically replacing p with the only thing that, that, that can make sense in this context, and that's p hat. So lots of people replace it with p hat. Another thing you can do in that environment is to just take the value of um, the proposed value for p, which maximizes the area, and that's when p is 0.5. Usually one of those two approaches is taken depending upon where P hat really is. So does that does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Um, do, do, does anyone else anyone else have any other any other questions they'd like to see like to see addressed this time? So again, we're thinking just about P hat. What can happen to the sample proportion as it varies across all possible random samples that you could take out of a given population? All those random samples have to be of some fixed size. So, you know, you might think about 100 or like in the written assignment five, you know, you took a sample of nine people. You know, there's a reason sometimes why you, uh, well, we'll see later, but there's a reason why sometimes these things come in, come in squares. If you're actually trying to do a calculation, it's usually for the sake of convenience. Um, so we can treat it as a normal distribution under mild conditions. I haven't really spelled out what those are. I might, or I think I'll probably do that at the end of class today. Um, I think you can just sort of not worry about, at least right now, what the conditions are. You can read a little bit about what they are in the book. Um, I'd like to explain why at least one or two of them might be important. Um, there's usually one of them that you just sort of have to, like, well, you look at how the survey was, was done and it's plausibly satisfied. Um, so what I'm gonna do, um, so I'll share, the, I'll share the screen again, but in the moment I'll bring people into groups again, which is maybe the normal practice. And um, so hang on just one second to switch. Yeah, right, okay. Um, so I'll bring people into groups for a minute and the questions that I would like the groups to consider and I, I forget exactly where we were and I probably wrote it down. Um, I'd like the groups to begin, um, to begin, to begin this handout, and this is the first handout on Blackboard. Um, it, um, I forget its name at this point. I think it's the one with sampling distribution in the title. But I'd like the groups to begin by considering, let me blow this up a bit because it's very hard to see, this is small. Um, I'd like the groups to begin by considering this question F, we really don't have an answer. Um, one thing here, uh, you want the values to be symmetric with respect to the proportion P. So um, P is in the middle, so you can presumably use stack crunch to come up with it. Um, with that in mind, you know, after you do F, I'd like the groups to consider, so that, that shouldn't take too long, but what I'd like the groups to consider next is this question two. Um, the questions I'd like the groups to consider are A, C, and then um, we'll come back, we'll report the answers and then we'll, we'll go into groups and I'd like people to debate E a little bit, or D a little bit, but maybe in the second meeting. Um, so just worry in groups now about this last question F and in questions A and C on the next problem. Think about them a little bit. Um, remember that we are treating the sampling distribution of P hat as a normal distribution with certain characteristics, which the problem in some sense defines for you. Um, and then, and then uh, we'll see what the answers are. So this shouldn't take too long. Um, I think to complete those three problems to kind of orient yourself or get the groups oriented to, in the direction of the problem it might take about, it might take a couple of minutes. Then you have three, three more problems to think about. So um, go ahead and work on those. Um, right now it's about 1.15. I'd like to meet again or reconvene as the big group at about 1.25. So let me break into groups right now, break into an even six. Um, groups are now created. Um, right now 115 let's meet again at 125 you should have gotten the invitation to go into the group so 
So how did it uh, how did it go? How did the groups groups all right? So um, so I'll talk about it briefly. Um, I think StackCrunch can be used for this. Um, we'll sort of finish the discussion, write a few things down, get kind of a comprehensive set of answers. Um, and you can stop me along the way if, uh, if you have questions. If you do, please speak up. Don't hesitate to ask. Um, so I think we were right here um, between what two values. So I forget exactly what the situation was here, but um, the groups might have to might have to remind me. Um, in this case, you know, I think what we're saying is that the value of n is, in this case is 250. The true proportion is, is for some reason um, 0.24. And the uh, standard deviation of p hat, what we're actually using for, you know, the value of the standard deviation that we're actually using for the, for the normal distribution looks like this guy over here. Um, it's this, uh, it's whatever this number is um, right there. Now offhand, I think I, think I would, uh, I think I would have remembered this from last time, but I don't happen to remember it now. So maybe the groups can remind me of what that number actually was. But to get to get something like F, you're looking between what two values, between what two values would we expect 95% of the sample proportions to fall. Um, to, to get something like that, my recommendation is just to, to use StatCrunch to try to come up with that. Um, so you have stat, go to calculators, go to normal. Um, so we have a nice normal distribution. And remember, we're thinking about the role of X in this example, the, the role of X that's on the screen as playing the role of P hat, which of course also varies with the sample. So I need to fix the mean and the standard deviation in order to do any of the calculations. So what we're saying is that the mean of the normal distribution that we will use looks like 0.24, because for some reason we know that that's what the true proportion actually is in this case. Um, the standard deviation is that square root thing, and I don't. Does any Does anyone know what that number actually is? Just give me a couple digits. Anyone can Anyone can answer this. Someone in the chat. Ah, okay, 0 0.027. That's right. Good. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so. If you're looking for where the values or the cutoffs along the, the horizontal axis where 95% of p hats fall, um, on StatCrunch, it's just enough to enter 0.95 here and you kind of automatically get those. Um, what you'll notice is you get kind of a nice symmetric distribution, um, a, a nice symmetric pair of numbers, 0 0.8, 0 0.1871, 0 0.2929. Another thing you might notice here is that 0.24 is right in the middle. Um, and if you remember the empirical rule, what we're saying roughly is that if you go two standard deviations to the right, two standard deviations to the left, that's where 95% of things fall. So I think probably, uh, you know, most people got something like that. I guess I should probably write this down. Um, what I'll do is I'll go off of this and I'll immediately forget um, what those numbers are. So I guess for the sake of um, what we'll talk about in a few minutes, I'd like to use interval notation. Um, so you're looking at the setup numbers between 0.1871 and 0.2929. Um, before I go on, is everyone familiar with what that symbolism means? If you're not, yeah. um, if you're not, uh, all all it means is that when you when you talk about between what two values, I mean you can always list the numbers, but what I want to say is that it's an interval. Um, you know, so the, the p hats are all between these two numbers. The p hats that we want extend between 0.1871 and 0.2929. Everything, those two numbers on the end, and everything in between. That's sort of what that's sort of what you're meant to think with think about think about that notation. That's interval notation. Um, probably seen it at some point in the past. Just means a, a line of numbers. The leftmost number is 0.1871. The rightmost number is 0.2929. Um, when we're thinking about the next problem, the mean and the standard deviation, you know, you're thinking about stressed students, you have a class of 45, you're treating that class as the sample. Um, so the true proportion is about 33%. Um, so the mean and the standard deviation of the proportion of stressed students, we're sort of going to ignore B for the moment. Um, but we're thinking that P hat is normally distributed with mean P and standard deviation P times one minus P divided by N. Um, so the mean that we're talking about is the true proportion value of P, the role of P is played by 0.33. Um, the standard deviation of P hat 
um, is played by, you know, whatever that is, but I guess that's the square root of 0.33. Um, one minus 0.33 is 0.67, I guess. And you divide that by 45. Um, if you would, somebody uh, just write that in in the chat. What's the number? Or you can yell it at me too. Um, if you do that calculation, what number do you actually get? I believe it is um, 0.105. Okay. 0.105. Okay, that seems reasonable. We'll use it. Um, and so when we're answering the questions going forward, when we're thinking about both C and then later, you know, when, when the groups think about D, you know, maybe how you would justify your decision on, on D, um, you're, you're thinking about, um, I guess I should summarize this somewhere. You're saying that P hat is normally distributed with expected value with mean equal to 0.33 and standard deviation 0.105. So this gives you an idea of its shape. Um, you're thinking about problem C. So what I'm hoping the groups did on C is like, what's the probability that no more than 25% of the students, before I go on, what kind of answers, what is no more, this is tricky. Um, no more than is the, is I guess equivalent to what? You want the, the, do you want the number? Oh no, I don't want the number yet. Um, just the words, um, no more than like, which tail do you want left or right? I guess. So we're, we're about to go to the, to, to stack crunch. Oh, the, the left tail. Yeah, you're right. Um, no more than. So we use a mean of 0.33. We use a standard deviation of uh, 0.105. So we're treating the normal distribution. I guess I kind of want standard. So I just look at the tails. Um, no more than the proportion is no more than 25% of the class. You feel like that's not terribly likely, but we'll see in just a second. Um, we do our calculation, um, we get about 22%. So did the groups get a number that looked like that? The number looks like it's about 0.223. Yep. Um, is that about, is that good? So let's write that down. Um, so let's see about, um, I guess if it's, a, it's a percent, I should report it this way, right? Or I guess you could also say if it's a probability, it's this is sort of equivalent. Um, so what I'd like the groups to do next, you play with stack crunch, you have some idea of the distribution that you're using. Um, I'd like to pause for a minute. Um, I'd like to have the groups to take maybe four or five minutes and think about D. Um, if 45% of the students, if it happened that 45% of the students said that they frequently experienced stress. So if, you act, if you've got an estimate like uh, 0.45, you actually, you know, you have a distribution. So all the work we're doing up to, up to D is explaining what the universe of possible values for P hat look like. Um, suppose you actually do the experiment and you run a poll and it turns out that 45% of the students say they frequently express stress in their daily, experience stress in their daily lives. Answer the question about, um, would, you, would you be surprised? And, and you gotta be careful here. It talks about using probabilities to support your answer. In some sense, that's true. Um, but just, just like that problem on a written assignment four, really the question is on the question on D is, where do you draw the line between an event, that, an outcome, and it, where do you draw the line on an extreme outcome versus a merely improbable one? Um, it's an artifact of the mathematical model that we're using that anything, any realization of P hat, just because of the mathematical model, just because we're replacing, just because we're replacing, uh, you know, this, this, this one thing with the normal model, any realization of P hat will have probability zeros. So that's not a question. Everything's equally unlikely in that sense. But when you're thinking about D, what you really want to think about is where do you draw the line? So you're dealing with the normal distribution. So where do the groups want to draw the line? And does 0.45 fall outside the line that the groups want to draw, if that makes sense. So I'd like I'd like the groups to consider that question for a minute. Um, it's a question about defining extreme events. Um, you know, when you're dealing with a normal distribution. So let's. It's about 1:34. Take about six minutes. Um, we'll break into groups. Should be done at about 1:40. Then we'll come back and have maybe a larger discussion. All right. Um, 
so this question is is more speculative. Um, you know, so before I write down anything at all, um, you know, when you're thinking about it, would anyone like to say where, you know, how they, their group would want to approach the problem? What is extreme in the view of the groups? What's the dividing line? There is no wrong answer. So do, would anyone like to volunteer a location where they feel like, you know, represents kind of an extreme region or at least beyond that represents an extreme region. So remember, yeah. What is the mean? The what? Mean, so if it's 0.33, um, like if it's the expected value, um, so in D, if it says like, if 45% of students say they frequently experience stress, that's kind of higher than the expected value. So, by, by quite a lot, right? Um, so that's 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 I think the idea um, on this problem. So let me write a little bit about it. Um, it's it's an interesting question because I think at least some of these sort of subjective judgment. But we we're thinking about. He had. I mean, we're really talking about where the sample proportion is at. So, we think about the distribution of p hat. We consider it to be normal, and the peak of this normal distribution is over 0.33. So, this is kind of a visualization of how the universe of possibilities for p hat look like. Some over here are very, very are quite a bit larger than 0.33. Some over here are quite a bit smaller, but most stuff's kind of near it. So no one's going to think about like 0.36 as being an extreme value, even though the probability of getting that exact value using this model is zero. So we want to say something, a couple of ways to do this, but we want to say something. We want to say something about the distance. between 0.45 and 0.33. Now, the most direct way of, of looking at distance is just to take the difference of those two numbers. So you can take 0.45 minus 0.33 and you get a number that looks like, I guess, 0.12, right? And that gets, you, that gets you pretty far down the road. You know, 0.45 is far away from 0.33 in an absolute sense, it's 0.12 units. Um, does anyone think that this is enough or would anyone like to say anything more at this point if they really wanted to, to say something about the sort of extreme nature of this event? Does anyone want to say anything more? Is there anything else I should be looking at? So I can take the difference in the distance between the two in the absolute sense is 0.12 units. Is there anything else I should be looking at when I'm looking at a distribution like this, like a normal distribution, is looking at the distance enough or do I need to add anything to that to contextualize the distribution itself? Um, maybe looking at the number of standard deviations away from the mean. Yes, that's, that's the typical approach. That's right. You calculate a z-score, right? And so um, you, you would take a look at 0.45 minus 0.33. We already know what that is, and you divide that by the number by the standard deviation itself. You put everything into units of standard deviation. And I think that's about 1.105. Um, so I guess you get 0.12 divided. Is this, is this seems seems right? Make sure. Yeah, that's what I wrote. Okay, so um, so you get a z-score. Uh, 0.12 divided by 0.105 is that big. Um, so let's see. Need to, maybe I'll, I'll quickly do a calculation in Excel because my fans, who knows what the number is. But if you take, what is it, 0.12 divided by 0.105, you get about 1.14. Um, so when you when you look at the z-score associated to to, to, to that 0.45, you number that's a little bigger than one, 
you're saying that 0.45, given, given the rest of the description of the problem, is about 1.14 standard deviations above the mean. Would anyone consider that z-score to be extreme? You can have different opinions about it, um, but is something that's a little more than one standard deviation north of the mean um, unusually large? Well, you know, opinions do vary about these things, um, but the fact that the standard deviation is as large as it is in relation to the mean, um, you have to be pretty far away from the mean to generate a large z-score. So personally, you know, I wouldn't think that 1.14 is really that far away. Um, you know, 0.45 looks like it's far away from 0.33, but when you look at things in units of standard deviation, maybe we don't see this. So a way to approach this problem um, might be to consider, well, how many standard deviations away would we consider to be unusual? There are different metrics for this. Um, so typically, the, the typical measurement, a typical measurement that, that's made, you know, a typical decision, it's not unusual. So maybe, so, so maybe not, maybe not too extreme. You know, it still falls within the, you know, falls outside of one standard deviation. So 0.45 falls outside of one, but inside of two. So it's not unusual in cases like this, just to say the following, anything outside two standard deviations is extreme. That's a judgment. So let's write that down here. This is a subjective judgment. <laughs> um, you could you could use you could use other measurements. Another typical or, or another subjective judgment is three, right? So you're you're talking about anything outside of three standard deviations. Opinions do vary on this. Um, I'd like to call your attention back to a problem that I think we talked about a couple of weeks ago, and I keep coming back to it. With the coin problem in written assignment four, um, you know, opinions did vary about that. But most people that, that responded to that question were not shocked by getting, get, getting a fair coin, flipping it 50 times, and winding up getting 30 heads out of 50 flips. This is not that unbelievable to them. So this is like saying, um, you know, in that case, you can kind of figure out that the standard deviation is something on the order. If you're, if, you're, if you're looking at some similar problem related to this, if you convert everything into proportions, you get a mean, if the coin is fair, you get a mean of 0.5. And if I remember right, a standard deviation of about 0.07 if you're dealing with proportions. So in this case, 0.6, somewhere in between one and two standard deviations. So in that example, most people were responding, I think, on, on that written assignment that, you know, it's not that extreme. It's distance from 25 in units of standard deviation is not so much that you would consider it, you know, beyond possibility that something like this extreme could occur. Um, and I think this reasoning with the coin is actually very good because if you're thinking about a coin, there might be a good reason to define extreme to be, to be a very unusual result because coins have uh, the mechanisms for producing coins is so regularized that you know, it would take sort of extraordinary evidence to convince you that the coin was unusual in some way. In this example, maybe maybe it wouldn't. Um, maybe you'd just say, look, um, you know, if you take the central 95% of p hat, um, that's about within two standard deviations. That's two standard deviations either way from the mean. Anything outside that I would consider to be extreme. Anything within it, not that unusual. But these things are judgments. Um, you could also look at the right or the left tail, and over time, we'll consider all of these things basically. But you know, when you when you classify the measurement, the 0.45 in units of standard deviation, um, I think the majority of people probably would not say that 1.4 standard deviations more than the mean is extreme enough um, to you know for for you to be surprised to cast doubt on the belief. That the pure that the that the true proportion was actually about 0.33, which is kind of what we're what we're getting at. So does everyone kind of follow this conversation? Um, when you when you record things as z scores, you're actually getting a measurement of how far away in standardized units um, the the result is from the mean, 
and you can talk a little bit about this, is it, is it extreme in the sense of that measurement? And that's typically what's done. So do you, do you have questions about this? Now, you know, what you consider personally extreme depends on context. Often that's a subjective judgment. Sometimes it's even a historical judgment, like 95% and 99%. Um, these numbers show up because in the original work that was done with, this sort of, with these sort of tools in the early 1900s, those just happened to be the numbers that you know, whoever was writing those papers thought of. Um, you know, there was probably some justification in context for using them, but you know, it's more or less a historical accident that you're talking about you know, 95%. Maybe one reason is that 95% corresponds to two standard deviations and it's easy roughly it's easy to remember. So is this, is this okay so far? Okay, so I'd like to introduce maybe the next topic. Um, we've got about four minutes. That leaves me with enough time at least to sort of hash out what we're gonna start with tomorrow. Um, if you kind of wanna see where we're going with this, tomorrow's discussion will concentrate exclusively on the notion of confidence interval construction for proportions. So I'll write a little bit here. Um, Put this up somewhere, you know, some some mythical day, I guess. Um, so you so you can read it. Um, but you know, you don't really have to take notes on this because I'm going to reproduce all this tomorrow anyway. But I do feel like I need to start today. So right now we are using. P hat to estimate P. Um, so there's some true proportion, um, but you can't really get access to it in most cases unless for some reason that you happen to know it. Um, and we can more easily get access to a P hat by taking a, um, a random sample of some size and computing the sample proportion from the random sample like we talked about at the beginning of class. And we can even say something um, we can even say something about the universe of possibilities for p hat. And that's the sampling distribution, right? That kind of keeps track of it. And, you know, under some mild conditions, um, p hat is normally distributed with mean and standard deviation, you know, that we've written written several times, you know, n is the sample size, p is the true proportion. Um, but we can actually do better, we can do a little better um, it turns out that we can come up with an interval estimate For P. Um, now there are, when, when people are talking about interval estimates, it's natural to think, but it's, it's actually not correct, but it is natural when you see this for the first time to think that we're gonna come up with an interval And then make, then make a probabilistic statement about P, his relationship to the interval. Um, everyone wants that to happen. Um, when, when you're seeing this for the first time, and I guess what I mean by that is, is that, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about mechanically how you, how we do this at the beginning, both conceptually and mechanically, I think at the beginning of class tomorrow. But whenever I say anything about confidence intervals, what most people believe is I'm about to tell them the following. So I have a point estimate and that's great, but it's better to have an interval of numbers that I can also use to sort of estimate P. I'm giving people a wider range of plausible values for P. Now that description is actually okay. Um, that is indeed how you should interpret the idea of a confidence interval. It's a plausible range of numbers, um, a plausible range of estimates for P. But most people don't want to leave it at that. They want to say something like, I have an interval of numbers and the probability that P is in that interval is a certain number. That is absolutely not what this is. Um, and you know, the reason why that, that interpretation doesn't work 
has a lot to do with a fundamental assumption we're making in a, in a course like this when you're dealing in the classical environment, you're assuming that the P is an unknown number. It can only be in one place. Um, and so we'll talk, I think we'll probably stop right there. It's about 155, so we should end. Um, we'll continue tomorrow to discuss the handout. Um, the next handout, I think we'll begin with a discussion of confidence intervals, what they are um, and what they are not. Um, give a short description of how they're constructed, um, and then you know work on some of the problems. I'll eventually getting around get around to talking about the conditions that have to be in play. I keep referring to them, but not spelling out what they are. You can read about those in the book if you want. Probably should repeat them. There's one thing I should probably do there to convince you that the conditions are reasonable. Um, but I think right now that's all I have to say. Um, if people have any questions, they can feel free to stay for a few minutes. If not, that's all right. Enjoy your day.